For over 30 years, the Arcadia players have been performing chamber music throughout Western Massachusetts, and the ensemble recently welcomed a new artistic director. Multi-instrumentalist, teacher, and composer Andrew Archechi has worked and studied music throughout Europe. I spoke with Archechi as well as longtime members Alice Robbins and Walter Denny to learn more about the group. Well, about 30 years ago, Meg Owen Brandon, who was at the time the uh, college organist for Mount Holyoke College, uh, decided that uh, she'd like to found a group devoted to the performance of early music, that is music from before 1750, as part of a sort of a general movement in the United States and Europe at that time toward taking a look at music that hadn't traditionally been performed very much by groups in, in Europe and North America up to that time. So that was part of what we sort of called the early music movement. There had been chamber ensembles around, but not very many Baroque orchestras, and especially in this area, um, where there is still a lot of activity in Boston, New York, um, Montreal, uh, other cities. But here in our valley, going up and down the Connecticut River, we wanted to have more going on. And Meg herself wanted an opportunity to conduct this music. And recently the Arcadia players have named a new artistic director. And beginning on March 1st, Andrew, you will be taking over leadership of the ensemble. Um, as somebody who has history with this group as a past performer, what was it um, about it that made you wanna apply for this position? And how does it feel to take on this role? Um, yes, I've played uh, viol de gamba, violone, and bass with the ensemble uh, on and off for several years, always as a contracted player. Um, I've always enjoyed the music making uh, and the last several years I've been directing um, programs myself and it's unusual, uh, you know, certainly not um, uh, a problem to direct from, you know, one of these instruments, but it's just less common. I'm very thankful that the Arcadia players took, you know, the application seriously and that, you know, I advanced and um, I had a wonderful time during the process. I mean, it was a long process, especially with COVID, of course. Um, I very much look forward to, uh, to working with the ensemble. Let's talk about the historical performances for a second, because I understand that the Arcadia players are known for their historical, historically informed performances. What does that mean and what does that entail? It means using the tools that one had at the time the music was written so um, not performing at modern pitch, which is about a half a pitch higher than we believe they performed during the 18th century. And the reason we know that is because if you take a, a wind instrument, such as a Baroque oboe, which has many fewer keys, it not only has a different timbre, but because of the way it's made and its length, it, it uh, vibrates at a lower pitch. So taking those as our guidelines and um, learning to enjoy what the instruments have to offer, not trying to make them into another kind of sound, it just opens up a lot of things for me. Alice, you teach at Smith and Mount Holyoke College in the Five College Early Music Program. Um, so in regards to exploration, classical music, um, and working with hopefully the next generation of performers, where do you see this genre of music heading? I see it. it's not only myself, but a lot of schools, even now, Juilliard, which was a bastion of modern performance for many years, is training many more young um, and um, polished musicians to open themselves up to these ideas too. And also some kids like myself were inspired at an early age to do something like this. 
and it gives much more opportunity. So um, there is a much larger pool of very accomplished musicians now. And Walter, you've been involved with different musical organizations since the early 60s, and you are the longest serving member on the board of directors for the Arcadia Players. As somebody, an artist with decades of knowledge and experience in this art form, how do you preserve and promote its importance for future generations? I think the most important thing, especially for early music and historically uh, informed performance, is to find your niche not only within the broader movement of classical music, and of course by classical music we mean music that that defies time, that's that's vibrant and powerful and moving no matter what. Uh, it, it was it was wonderful 400 years ago and it's still wonderful. That's what we mean by classical music. And here in the Valley with all the departments and all the colleges and all the independent musical organizations of which there are quite a few that present concerts, uh, we have to find our own place uh, uh, and develop our own audience within that spectrum. It's not the easiest task because, of course, in some ways it is a zero-sum game. What we have to do and what we're, 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 we've are we been doing for 30 years in which we hope that Andrew is going to help us advance is to increase, uh, increase our uh, concert-going uh, um, public uh, to appeal to, uh, as Alice mentions, now younger people are becoming interested in this through uh, through their schooling to capitalize on the fact to, to, to get younger audiences. And um, we have to continue to rediscover our place, uh, continue to rediscover our niche. And that's one of the reasons why we're so excited that, uh, that uh, Andrew is going to help us develop uh, uh, our, our approach to the future of this uh, early music movement. And speaking of rediscovering, um, Andrew, you were talking about the complications of COVID. And so for the past two years, you have been limited to virtual performances where you would be in person performing. Um, so talk to me about what's coming up in the future. What do you hope to do with the Arcadia players? I think we, like so many ensembles um, and to a large extent uh, arts you know, organizations now, um, need to retain um, an element of flexibility. I mean, we just have to be flexible. Um, and I think we uh, will resume with live programs as soon as we can. Um, you know, again, there are new logistics involved, um, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, coordinating with the venue, um, ensuring uh, masking, ensuring, um, you know, vaccination, et cetera. And there are new logistics for, for everyone. Um, uh, and we're not alone. Uh, I think, many, like I said, many ensembles are, are struggling with this. I mean, everyone is trying to navigate this new world. And even now, uh, you know, with the new variant, um, and it takes, you know, a long time to plan um, a season of concerts. Uh, and so there's, there's planning. I mean, even now, um, you know, we're looking to the spring to find a date and then of course to next season. Um, so there are several months worth of planning involved uh, and then, of course, that can be disrupted. And so it's very hard. Um, I think, you know, as we look to return with live music making, um, you know, we certainly will do that. And then if need be, maybe we will we'll do some video programs. It's, it's very hard to know. Um, but, you know, we're not alone. <laughs> So in 2019, the Arcadia Players celebrated its 30th anniversary. Congratulations on that amazing milestone. What do you all hope for chamber music and the Arcadia Players for the next 30 years to come? We obviously hope that we'll build our audience, that we will continue to um, continue to benefit from the types of discoveries that people like Andrew, by going in to Italy and doing research, we, there, there's lots of music out there to be discovered. It's still in manuscript form. It's hidden away in monasteries and churches and private collections and libraries. I would hope that we would continue to capitalize on all these new and wonderful discoveries that are being made. We have a program in waiting uh, of a, a performance of a St. Matthew Passion by the German composer Tyler in a new performing edition. There's lots and lots of stuff that is very old, but it's very new. We're going to be getting new stuff out there that's being discovered or rediscovered. I'm hoping that that rediscovery process, together with an increasingly large audience of, we hope, increasingly younger people, uh, I hope that's where the future of Arcadia Players lies. There are many ways that this music can appeal to wide audiences, um, both young and old. 
I have always thought that the aesthetic is in the art. I mean, obviously there are no recordings from this area. And so, you know, looking at the art is very important. And there are ways to connect with, um, you know, people interested in, in, in history, art history, uh, et cetera. And so I, I enjoy putting together, you know, programs and there's a large part of any directorial role aside from the music making. I mean, there are of course logistics and thematic questions involved. And so, um, you know, I certainly will uh, discuss these details with the board, but I think, um, you know, trying to find interesting themes um, and weaving, you know, stories through um, programs, but, but you know, ha- um, ensuring that they appeal to wide audiences. I mean, they can be, um, you know, true to the historicalness that is important to this kind of music making, um, but I think that there can be elements that appeal to wide audiences as well.